name is Dr. Jacob Eisenbach. I was for five years incarcerated by the Nazis. I was born in the city of Lodz in Poland. The city had 700,000 in population and half of them were Jewish. I like to tell the story about my experiences under the Nazi regime because it is very important for my children, my grandchildren, and all future generations that this story will never be forgotten. I was very fortunate to have a great good childhood. I had a family of uh, two younger brothers, an older sister and my parents. Very loving family. My mother died one year before the war. I was 15 at the time. She would gather her four children, put her arms around us, and bless us by saying, you are my greatest possession. She never realized how important that blessing was to us under the Nazi occupation, because it made us feel that we are loved and our lives are important. And no matter what Hitler said about us, and no matter what he did to us, he could not possibly destroy those feelings. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler attacked Poland. It was a great surprise. He came to power in 1933, and shortly after he came to power, he started arming the German army. He had an air force, he had tanks, he had heavy uh, armaments, ammunition, trucks, motorcycles, he had everything he needed to attack Poland. Poland was completely unprepared. They didn't have an air force or armaments or, or ammunition of trucks, absolutely nothing. The Polish army was moving around on horses. It was no match to the powerful German army. My city was occupied by the Nazis within seven days of the outbreak of the war, September 1st, 1939. Shortly after they occupied my city, they started building a barbed wire fence around the old part of the city. Every 200 feet around that fence was a watchtower, which was occupied by Nazis with machine guns and searchlights. They issued an order that every Jew has to be inside that ghetto before May 1st, and any Jew found outside the ghetto after that date would be shot to death on the spot. Before that date, it was still possible to escape from the Nazi part of Poland to the Russian part of Poland. One week before the war broke out, Hitler signed a non-aggression pact with Stalin, the president of the Soviet Union. They agreed to divide Poland and not interfere with each other's activities. So many Jews from Lodz escaped to the Russian part of Poland. The Russians did not kill Jews. Among those people who escaped was my sister Fela. She was 18 at the time, she just finished high school. She and a few of her girlfriends escaped to the city of Lvov, occupied by the Russians. And we could communicate with her. But after May 1st, 1940, 
the ghetto was had nothing concealed off from the rest of the world. We lost all communication with anybody. There was no mail, no radio, uh, no newspapers, nothing. We were completely cut off. We didn't know what was going on outside the ghetto. <clears throat> After the war, I met a lady who was from the city of Lvov, where my sister moved into. And she told me what happened in Lvov. Two years after the outbreak of the war, Hitler decided to break the non-aggression pact with Stalin and invade the Soviet Union because there were about three million Jews in the Soviet Union and he had plans for them. After they locked up the ghetto, maybe within a year or so, they started shipping people out to the... Uh, so they, they were told that the people that they are being shipped to other camps for work, but that was a big lie. We found out from Polish uh, train conductors that they taking those people by train loads, seven, eight people per load, and took them to these camps, and no one ever came out of there, and they could smell burning flesh in the air. So we know what the Nazis were doing with those people that they were shipping out of the ghetto. Once they locked up the ghetto, on May 1st, 1940, they were in full control of the food supplies, and they gave us just enough food so we don't die from starvation. But many people were dying from starvation. We also had a typhus epidemic, a deadly disease. One day, my youngest brother, Henry, who was 11 years old, developed a very high fever. We called the doctor. He diagnosed him with typhus, and he told us to take him to the hospital. So we took Henry to the hospital, and the next morning, I was on my way to work, walking. I had a little job there, and I was passing one of the two hospitals. And what do I see? There's a big truck, the kind of truck that is used to transport cattle, with spaces between the boards, guarded by Nazis with machine guns. And they were loading patients from that hospital on that truck. 30 layers of live people were loaded on top of each other. When I saw that, I started running to the other hospital where I took my brother to the day before. It was three miles. And the streets were deserted. On the way, I came across another truck like this moving away from that other hospital where my brother was. And I stopped for a moment to look between the boards to see if I can see my brother. I didn't see him. That truck was loaded with live people to the top. The driver had a companion in the driving compartment. He saw me look at that, uh, looking at that truck. He pulled out his machine gun and started shooting at me. But it didn't reach me because I was in front of an apartment building and I ran into the building and his bullets didn't reach me. So the truck continued away from the hospital and I continued running toward the hospital. When I got there, I saw a third truck standing there in front of the hospital being loaded with patients. And Nazis guarded it with machine guns. Couldn't get in. The hospital grounds were surrounded by an eight-foot fence. So I went to the back of the, of the fence, and I saw a big crowd of people standing outside that fence, and nurses were handing patients over to that crowd to save them from the Nazis. 
I climbed that eight foot fence. To this day, I can't figure out how I did. I climbed the fence, went up to the room where I put my brother in the day before, and he was not there. So I asked the nurses, where is Henry? But Henry was taken 15 minutes away, 15 minutes ago. And he was in that truck that I passed in the streets. So I have never seen Henry again. That left my father, my brother Sam, and me in the ghetto because the rest of my family of 100 was already shipped out of the ghetto. One day, my father receives an order to report for deportation with 600 other men. And we didn't know what they were doing with these 600 men. But I met a man after the war who escaped from that group. And he told me what the Nazis did with them. They had them carry heavy rocks from place to place, useless work on a starvation diet, and they all died out. And I have never seen my father again. That left me and my brother Sam. One day, I received an order to report for deportation. That was a death sentence. My brother Sam did not get the order to report. He didn't have to go. I did not report. I went into hiding, and my brother was with me. I was hiding in friends places. Before I went into hiding, Sam and I lived in a one-room place upstairs with squeaking wooden steps leading to it. 20 below zero outside and 20 below zero inside. There was no fuel. After a month of hiding, we ran out of places to hide. After we left that room where we lived, we took everything out of it before we left and put a padlock on it. And neighbors were telling us that the Nazis were there, that the police was there many times looking for me. And when they saw the padlock, they walked away. So when we ran out of places to hide, we decided to go back to that room. We had a friend put the padlock on the outside. He brought us a little, a little food rations and water. The room was completely empty and we put a pile of straw in the corner. We were hiding in that pile of straw. And we were in that room for a while. And one night at midnight, we hear heavy footsteps on those squeaking wooden floors and loud voices. Two policemen are coming up. One of them had a flashlight. He looks at the padlock and he says, but there's a flashlight here, there's, there's a padlock here, there's nobody in there, let's go. And the other policeman was a wise guy and he says, no, let's not go. Let's knock off the padlock. So I went downstairs, found the crowbar, came back, knocked off the padlock, opened the door, and the first policeman with a flashlight looks around the room and he says to him, well, the room is empty, there's nobody here, let's go. And the other guy says, no, let's not go. Let's look at that pile of straw. And he finds us. And I know that I'm going to die. I know I'm going to Auschwitz. Sam didn't have to go. He wasn't ordered to report. He could have said to me, Jack, I know where you are. You are going to the gas chambers. I'm not going with you. But this is not what Sam said. What he did say is, Jack, our whole family is now gone. 
Now they're taking you away. I'm not staying here by myself. I'm going with you. Wherever you go, I go. And whatever will happen to you will happen to me. And he said that knowing full well that he's going to the guest chambers with me. That's the kind of a bond we have in our family. They loaded us in trains, cattle trains, three days and three nights. After three days, they unlocked the cars of the train. Each car was guarded by Nazis with machine guns and told us to get out. And we were sure we were in Auschwitz. We didn't know, but we expected that this was Auschwitz. But before long, we found out that this was not Auschwitz. We were in Auschwitz. So they did take us to Auschwitz. We were at the doorstep of the gas chambers, but they never unloaded us in Auschwitz. They took us to a munition factory in the city of Skarżysko, about 70 miles away from the city of Lodz. There was a munition factory which was, before the war, operated by the Polish government. Nazis took over it, and they had an adjoining concentration camp with 6,000 Jews who were working in that factory. And this is where we arrived. We were there for a few months. That was in already April of 1944. And we were there till about July. The Eastern Front was getting closer and closer. The Nazis lost so many soldiers on the Eastern Front. And they took their own German people out of war out of their war production to send them to the front to replace the dead soldiers. And they decided in the last minute, those young Jews who are still able to work, instead of guessing them, we'll put them to work in our war production. And Sam and I was work, were working in that munition factory. In July of 1944, after we have been about three months in that concentration camp in Skarzysko. The Eastern Front was moving closer and closer. And the Nazis decided to move the factory closer to Germany to the city of Częstochow. And we had to move those heavy machines which weighed about two, three tons on wooden rollers. One of my friends, Benjamin, a good personal friend, fell on the a machine and broke a leg. And he was screaming in excruciating pain. And a Nazi soldier came along and put a bullet in his head. He wasn't about to help a sick Jew. My blood was boiling. But Benjamin was dead. So we arrived in Częstochow. We did the same thing that we did in Skarżysko. The name of that munition factory was Hasag. On January 15, 1945, we could hear, we could hear bullets flying, shrapnels, armaments on the outside in the city of, of Chesterhoff. And all of a sudden, the Nazi soldiers guarding that camp with machine guns disappear from the towers. They got ordered to run for their lives because the Russians are after them. And the Jewish commander of the camp told us not to leave the camp during the night. It's too dangerous. All these 
bullets and, and shrapnels are flying all over the place. So we followed that advice. The next morning, we woke out of the camp, Sam and I. I met my future wife in a very romantic place, at this Nazi concentration camp in Skarzysko. So the three of us, her name was Irene, the three of us walked out of the camp on January 16th, 1945. We were free. After I retired from dentistry, I'm not retired. I have a new profession. I speak all over the country and internationally on the topics of hate, discrimination, the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, and the problem of global importance, which is genocide. Genocide has been taking place for thousands of years against all kinds of people, all kinds of races, religions, and nationalities, and cultures, not only against Jews. And I'm devoting considerable time in my speeches about how to counteract and how to prevent genocides. The plan is, that the people who are likely to commit a genocide are very visible in society. One way to prevent them to commit genocides is to use very influential politicians to put political pressure on them. So they can put economic pressure on them. So they can put military pressure on them. They could have a powerful army. You don't want to lose a single life in the process. But just the presence of a powerful army will prevent them from committing genocides. There are many organizations, international organizations, that have been established for the purpose of preventing and eliminating genocides. And this plan would have to be under the leadership of the United States. And someday, the day will come where the people of the world will be able to say with confidence, never again. I give a lot of speeches on the topic of the Holocaust and the other topics. And after my speeches, I have question and answer periods. One of the questions I'm asked, I was asked, is did I lose faith in humanity? I tell my audiences the story of the King of Denmark, 
Most people have never heard of it. When the Nazis occupied Denmark, they ordered the Jewish people to put on yellow stars on the outer clothing so they could identify them in the streets, round them up and send them to the gas chambers. And the king of Denmark said to Hitler, if this is what you are going to do to our Jewish citizens, I'm going to put on a yellow star. My entire family will put on yellow stars. Every Dane in the country will put on yellow stars and you will not be able to tell who is Jewish and who is not. Then he was concerned that the Nazis may come up with other ways to identify the Jews. So he put them on fishing boats and sent all of them to neutral Sweden. And all Danish Jews survived the war in Sweden. Hitler could not touch them in Sweden. He did not occupy Sweden. Chiyuni Sugihara was a Japanese diplomat. He was the ambassador of Japan with Lithuania. He couldn't stand watching what the Nazis were doing to the Jews. So he asked his government for permission to issue 6,000 visas to the Jews so they could go to Japan and other far eastern countries where Hitler couldn't reach them. The Japanese were allied with the Nazis at that time, and they turned down his request. What did Mr. Sugihara do? He disobeyed the order of his government and issued those 6,000 visas against the orders of his government, knowing full well what they would do to him, which they did. They fired him from his position and took him and his family back to Japan, and he lived in poverty and obscurity. Now, Mr. Sugihara is a great humanitarian hero in Japan, and the Japanese people in Little Tokyo and Los Angeles also built a statue in his, in his honor. And in Japan, there's a big statue in his honor. Mr. Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish diplomat. He was the ambassador to Hungary. He came from an aristocratic Swedish family. And when Hitler occupied Hungary, he was just about to ship 100,000 Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz. And Mr. Wallenberg issued them 100,000 Swedish visas. They instantly became Swedish citizens, and Hitler could not touch them. The other reason why I do not feel like having revenge is because I'm happy to live in that great country of the United States. I'm in fairly good health. This is my home. And I'm an American patriot. And the white and blue flag with the Star of David on it, which is the flag of the State of Israel, is flying proudly. It's a great state. And this is my revenge. As far as America's United States anti-Semitism in the United States, it's there. We have skinheads, we have anti-Semites, we have racists. But I have lived here for 70 years, since 1950. I have never experienced anti-Semitism. Those people, the races, the 
and anti-Semites. They are failures in society. They are failures in employment. They are failures in education. They are failures in business. The only thing they are good at is hating. And I do not think that they have much following. Their following is very small. So after living happily in the United States, I'm not, I'm not afraid of them. But we are stronger and louder and that they will never catch up with us. We are concerned about some anti-Semitic outbreaks. And we have to do whatever we can, we can to protect Jewish institutions and, and uh, synagogues uh, from attacks. But it's a, it, it's a big problem, but it's not a problem that is supported by the majority of the American people. So there's a very small percentage of anti-Semites in the United States. Mark Twain, a great American writer, once said, what the Jewish people have persecutors and killers for thousands of years, but they are still around. What is the secret of the Jewish people? There is no secret. The main reason we are still alive, alive and we're going to continue to be around is because of our indestructible faith in God. And someday we will reach the state of never again. Thank you. humanity to be erased from human memory.